Welcome back, everybody, to this talk. And it's talk number 11 on the CS Summer School on Security of Things with me, um, Simeon Liedmann. We will today have a look at the ethics of hacking, um, shortly discuss attack vectors, penetration testing, and the disclosure of vulnerabilities after um, paying attention to what is a hacker, what are hacks. Yeah. Um, I thought by now most of you would probably know me, so I put some new information on this slide. Um, I am a member of the Chaos Communication Club, which is probably why I'm affine to this topic. I'm also a member of the local hack space here at uh, Rostock. I spend some of my time volunteering in a school lab, teaching kids electronics and uh, programming. And also uh, I'm part of the... Uh, Jugendhakt, which is a, a German hackathon for kids to, to teach them in, in, in the IT area to self-empower them. Um, I mentioned before that I'm a privacy friend, so I like using Signal rather than WhatsApp, and I'm a Creative Commons fan rather than copyright, and also a huge fan of Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. All of this, for me, is related to hacking. Um, a disclaimer at the beginning, I do, I did not do any disclosure myself. I'm not a lawyer, so anything I say here is not legally binding. This is, uh, talk is not free of personal opinions, while I still try to uh, give you valuable information rather than only personal opinions. Um, yeah, and as I, I said, um, I am a member of the Chaos Communication Club, where I volunteer to... Uh, help live translating talks at the conferences, which uh, you can also find at media.ccc.de, which is also a resource I refer to. Okay, um, here's what uh, is today's table of content. Um, I thought it's useful to have a look at uh, the word hacker, because I find that um, it's used in multiple different ways, while the uh, there's a huge discrepancy between how the other people or normal people or press or the outside view on, on what is a hacker versus the inside view of the hacking community and their self-understanding of hackers. I think it's worth spending a little bit of time there. Then I will present uh, the hacker ethics, which is uh, a core, core thing in the hacker culture. And to me, this is important because uh, it... Uh, helps to tell the evil hackers, which are uh, something totally different than the uh, positive hackers, to tell them apart from each other, or I think there's a core difference between them. We will then have a short glimpse at attack vectors that um, maybe help uh, to, uh, to find vulnerabilities uh, in, in devices, in setups, in systems, which uh, is done by penetration testing. And once you found a vulnerability, you may want to disclose it. And so the last part, we will talk a little bit about disclosure of vulnerabilities. And of course, I'll invite you uh, to discussions afterwards. OK, starting with the hacker dualism. Uh, on the one side, we have these media representation of hackers, where they all wear black masks and are shady and dodgy and uh, evil, they attack you and you can have no means to, uh, to defend yourself because they are everywhere, they're anonymous whatsoever. And on the other side, when I first went to my first hacker congress, um, I found uh, that the mentality of people there is more like the other picture on this slide. They were very, very excellent to each other. And in fact, this was a motto on, 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 on every hacker event I participated so far. People got out of their way to be nice and friendly to others. And not only others because they know them, but others because others are people to be friendly with. And for me, this is a huge conflict because you can easily find things like this. And this is a very old one. Um, hackers can turn your computer into a bomb. Ah, threats, they are, they are evil and you, you don't have any means to protect them. And these kind of media you can find all the time. You just watch the news, you read the papers, or you even watch a movie where, where it's an evil hacker that's probably becoming rich or famous or powerful by 
by cracking into your computer and, and, and suddenly having all the money, all the power in the world. So these kind of representations for hackers are there, even though personally I think it's a wrong, wrong word for, 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 for the concept behind it. So I do what I like most when I'm dealing with wordings. I check up what's, what's Wikipedia's um, content uh, about this. And the English Wikipedia says uh, hackers are, a computer hacker is a computer expert who uses their technical knowledge to overcome a problem. Okay, this is, this is what I would think is a computer hacker, I see IT security hacker maybe, uh, computer science hacking, but there's definitely more to it. And um, I search for another uh, definition and there is the request for comments from 1983, which is a glossary um, explaining some wordings roughly around the internet. And there it says, a hacker is a person who delights in having an intimate understanding of the internal workings of a probably technical system, computers, and computer networks in particular. Um, they also mention already that the term is often misused in a, in a pejorative context where cracker would be the correct term, meaning something like an evil hacker breaking into stuff for the harm of for the sake of harming. So, um, yeah, this is, if I think of hackers, this is what I think. I think there's a malicious exploiting kind of, exploiting vulnerabilities kind of thing called hackers, which maybe should be called crackers, uh, with a C rather than an H, a CR. And then on the other hand, there is my personal experiences with the hacker community where uh, I think it's a totally opposite. People try to find and fix vulnerabilities in order to improve the tools, the systems, the technology that we all use, that others use, that they have the skills to improve. And they often do so voluntarily. They often do so without getting paid, without getting famous. And of course, this is the moment where you don't really recognize it because of course the news telling you that some cracker uh, stole lots and lots of credit card info or Bitcoin or whatever valuable items or did very impressive uh, things in politics, then everybody's talking about it. But nobody's talking about somebody that helped somebody else to fix a problem in the system. And there's a good reason why people do not talk upfront about it, but we will later talk about the disclosure in more detail. So. The Wikipedia article about hackers also says something uh, uh, in another line. It says, someone who's able to subvert computer security. Uh, if doing so for malicious purposes, the person can all be, also be called a cracker, which is what I uh, just said from the, from the request for comments uh, glossary. And uh, this one focuses on computer security because it's probably what we would like to talk about today. But my personal understanding of the word hacker is much more than computers. Uh, it's even more than technic. There's also um, all sorts of hackers. And um, to, to make this point, I, I, I said I just write down some catchphrasing words. So we'll play a little bit of buzzword bingo here. There are hackers that are usually referred to as white hat hackers, which are um, using their skills in a totally legal way. For example, you have a system, you think maybe it's not secure, so you hire or you ask somebody with skills to check whether your system is, is, is error prone or is it, is it safe and stable, is it secure? And there's black hat hackers which are referred to by the means of their doing is illegal, they have no legal checks in advance. And then there's gray hat hackers, which sort of do hack into stuff. For example, computer systems, which they not explicitly have the uh, legal clearance to do so, but they, they provide the assumption that they do not do this for evil harm. 
for example, when they found a vulnerability and they get in touch with the owners of the system and they say, hey, look, I checked it, um, I found a vulnerability, I'd like you to help, uh, I'd like to help you with fixing this vulnerability because if I could, could use it, others can also, and I think your system is far too important for others to hack into it. These kind of actions may often be, be uh, what was meant by, by gray hat hackers. Um, there are different motivations for hackers. It's, it's reaching from playful investigation, from curiosity to understand, over people want to get fame, want to get wealthy, become wealthy, uh, people reach for power, they may want to ha have an uh, influence in political or so social change, sometimes via civil obedience, disobedience, I mean. There's even situations where people use their skills in order to revenge or to harm somebody. And there's all sorts of con contexts, as I already said. Le is it a legal situation? Is it illegal or legal? Or is it some somewhat grayish? How skilled are the people? Are they very skilled ones? Maybe they're professionals hired for their skills. Maybe they're rather unskilled. That's what often called script kiddies. So they use technical systems without understanding them. Um, what What's the process? Is the, is the process of hacking something that happens secretly? Or is it done transparently? For example, company hiring somebody in order to check their own systems. Um, and as I mentioned, there's even non-technical hacking, like food hacking or life hacking. For example, if you have a bunch of bananas and you rub a little bit of tin foil on the tip of, uh, of the bananas, they, they usually keep fresh for longer. This is one thing I learned from a life hack book, which uh, to me is a hack because uh, it improves my life. I, I, there was a problem. I, somebody found a way to fix that problem. And it's a very easy fix and uh, my bananas keep fresh for longer. Yeah, um, other words, for example, that you may know is anonymous. It's something uh, very strange. It's a, it's a group, it's an, 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 an anonymous thing in the internet, a movement. Uh, everybody could claim to be anonymous. Nobody could claim to be anonymous. Nobody really knows who's behind it. There are some people that have used the name of uh, anonymous and then got identified, but it's, it's not a, a, a thing that people can grasp. It's often uh, it, it, the, the group or the, the anonymous phrasing often was used in political activism. Uh, there's all sorts of threat scenarios and people are afraid of them and I can very well understand that people are afraid if there's something you cannot really grasp, you grasp your head around, get, get your head around it, grasp it. Um, but it's uh, it's also something the the I know a lot of white hat hackers that do not like the idea of people using a name of anonymous and using the hacking threat scenario to 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 become important. But there are one form of hacktivists, which are people that are motivated by by political and social change and. And of course, there's uh, something like ethical hacking, which is even a certificate you can you can do in the industries in order to show that you have the entire skills to to assess computers uh, and uh, find security problems, which you will do in a legal base to earn money, for example. Um, one thing that uh, I remembered is a talk I once watched. Uh, it's a TED talk again by Kirin Lazari. Uh, it's titled Hackers, the Immune System of the Internet. Uh, I can highly recommend it because she gets it very well to the point why I think hackers are a force for the good in the world, even though the phrasing sometimes is, uh, is used aggressively or negatively. Um, yeah, it's free to watch if you want. Um, in her talk, she also talks about uh, Barnaby Jack, uh, who once said, sometimes you have to demo a threat to spark a solution. And this is a quote I put here because I think it transports one core idea of the hacker community that I know. Uh, it is people 
have th their systems, and these systems have problems. And if you go to the system owner and say, your system has a problem. For example, you have a pacemaker, and uh, somebody can interrupt with the wireless communication of the pacemaker that is implanted in, the people's, in other people's body. And you say, OK, I could technically interfere with this communication. Sometimes it happens that the owner of the, of the system, maybe the vendor, just says, OK, but nobody does this, or I don't believe you, or there's no such thing. You cannot interfere with it. And as soon as you explain to people that if you could interfere with the wireless communication of a pacemaker, there will be lives at stake, suddenly you probably get more force that helps you to drive towards fixing a bug or not accepting the situation as it is. The status quo may not be sufficient. Of course, this has caused quite a lot of trouble in the, in, in the past. If you look at any hacks, uh, huge famous hacks, it's all too often that the people that found vulnerabilities were sort of the messenger of the, of the bad news and therefore they were targeted by lawsuits, by all sorts of uh, revenge or not accepted. And sometimes this uh, costs the life of hackers, which spend a lot of energy and time to, to do something to show that there is a really important thing and they know that it's not secure and they would like it to be more secure. But what they got in return is not uh, helpful. Th thanks, uh, thank you for for help or for pointing out that there's a weakness. But people get angry and pissed, and they, they start firing at them. Um, to get an idea of hacktivism, only very briefly because it's not the focus of city. Uh, I think uh, one thing that is very clear to my mind is the campaign "Public Money, Public Code" from the Free Software Foundation uh, uh, Europe. The idea behind it is the taxpayers, they um, pay money for software products, which all too often is proprietary, proprietary, proprietary uh, licensed, meaning uh, the taxpayer cannot reuse the software somewhere else easily. And a bunch of hacktivists, uh, hacktivists already understood that a free software would, would solve many, many problems if every software that is paid by taxpayers' money would be free and available for everybody else to use, to reuse, then the taxpayer would not have to pay multiple times for almost similar services. Um, they put on a nice video, which I linked here, in all sorts of languages, so go and find out if there's your language available for this video, explaining uh, the that, uh, problems that come if, if, if public code is uh, if, if public money is spent for code that is not publicly uh, reusable available and uh, one example they come up with in this uh, in this video is an english page was uh, was originally from uh, from england fixmystreet.com it was a, a technical system a tool that could that empowers the the civilians on, on the street to uh, to help fixing things like oh there is a hole in the street or there's a trash bin missing, or some something happened. There's a lot of uh, trash around here after a storm or something, and then the the local uh, community is is able to react on it and, and, and entirely with the aim of improving the people's life. And this was free code, and it got adapted all over the world. And a very similar thing is class shift. Uh, higher O, which is here in Rostock, it's the same idea behind it. The people living in Rostock or visiting Rostock, they can just pinpoint towards problems, and the the local uh, uh, the politics can then deal with it. You can mention that uh, here is a bike lane missing, or at this uh, intersection, the the traffic light is always red for for bike, so it's 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 not good because maybe if the bikes ha had a more pleasant journey there. People would more ride bikes instead of cars or something. If this is what, what drives you, you now have a place where you can easily interact with them. It's one example of uh, where, where uh, free public money, public uh, for, for, for public code, which uh, shows that there is uh, benefits. But enough of, uh, of hacktivism now. Um, the, the hacker community 
put together in one phrase. The idea behind it is the best thing I know is the quote from uh, Frank Rieger, one spokesman of the uh, uh, Chaos Communication Club. Um, he said it in the movie All Creatures Welcome, which is a documentary about the hacker events taking place in, in Europe, in Germany. He said, the core of the hacker culture is breaking some stuff, fixing things, which is exactly what security hackers, IT security hacking means to me. Penetrate stuff, find vulnerabilities in order to improve them, fix then the vulnerabilities, making the original targets even better, stronger, steel manning them, in, in other words. And all, it's, it's not rare, rare that hackers have the impression that, um, how he continues this quote, this planet is our spaceship here in the universe and it really needs fixing. This is how he continues the, the quote. I think it shows the idea behind what hackers really are rather than what hackers are often depicted as. Okay, but I mentioned it. There's a lot of personal opinion in here. I already mentioned the Chaos Communication Club. Uh, why? Because it's uh, the yard largest association of hackers in Europe. Their self-understanding is to mediate between in in the in the um, in the field in the conflict field between between technical and social development. They promote decentralized uh, setups for all sorts of things, uh, rather than centralized setups. Um, for example, they organize in decentralized local associations. Um, they do investigations and political consulting. Um, what they don't do, they don't develop tools for, for politics, but sometimes they help developing, they help and, and pinpoint to problems or pinpoint to solutions to overcome problems. Just recently they did so with developing the, uh, the Corona tracing app and, and making sure that some core principles are, uh, are used in the right way in order to come up with a product that is trustworthy. Um, they also provide anonymizing, anon anonymizing services and communication infrastructure. Um, because they're skilled, they, they do this uh, from their self-understanding of, of empowering others. And of course, they live by the principles of the hacker ethics. Um, they provide information about the technical and social issues like surveillance, privacy, freedom of information, hacktivism, data security, and pretty much any other technology or hacking field. And the self-understanding here is not we are smarter than others, we know what you should do. It's rather, hey, we know problems, we can talk to you about these problems and we can teach you to learn, get your hands on the machines, understand. And um, from that point on, that's where they try to help. Um, yeah, and as I said, they try to live by the ha ha hacker ethics which is um, what brings us to the next uh, point. In the 1980s, the hacking scene developed out of an area of computer security at the Massachusetts Institute for Technology, the MIT. And now it seems to be a, uh, a development, a scene that likes to take apart stuff, that likes to understand and learn and critically analyze it. Uh, to creatively reuse items or setups or systems uh, and to improve it while taking social responsibility to share the knowledge they gain through this process to uh, together improve the world. Hacking in this sense becomes a form of social engagement shaping our world and therefore to me it is a very core democratic value and to let this not go straight there is the hacker ethics um, to help as a guideline. One point is um, the access to computers and anything which would help you in, in teaching and understanding the world should be unlimited and it should be totally unlimited. Uh, and it's focused on get your hands on it, do it yourself, not just listen to others. 
Um, all the information should be free. Mistrust authority, promote decentralization. For me, uh, the second part of the statement is the more important one. You don't even have to mistrust authorities in order to understand that decentralization might be a good idea. If you have a very trustworthy infrastructure that is based on centralization, then you have a single point of failure. Decentralization helps you to get rid of dependencies you don't want to have in your system. Um, hackers should, should be judged by their actions, not bogus criteria such as degrees, age, race, positions, gender, all these kind of things. And this is also what you could experience if you would join a hacker event. Then, of course, it's not perfect, but to me it's a huge difference because suddenly people act differently because they have uh, the trust that they will not be judged for the usual criteria. So they wear different clothing, they behave different, but still they behave in a way to be excellent to each other. Um, yeah, you can create art and beauty on a computer, which is something I put in a picture here. What you can see is uh, um, a sand pill, uh, pit where there is a um, presenter on top and a 3D scanner and it scans the surface high. And if it's high enough, it, may, it projects the image of a, a high mountain peak and if it's uh, a large, uh, larger distance, then it, it eventually turns blue for, for water. And so <laughs> not only kids are gathering at the sand pill to form land shape, to land shape, to form mountains and to dig oceans, but it's it's a place where all the adults do, st stand and they smile and they interact with the system. It's a very, I think, entertaining thing. It's not important in the world, but uh, as in a, in a sense of it, it, it does not help somebody to live longer or to be healthier or to live more secure, but uh, it, it's beautiful and it's joyful. Um, computers can change your life for the better. This is uh, one point of view that is uh, also established in the hacker ethics because it uh, started from computers uh, and computers are a core thing to the, to the community. Um, don't litter in other people's data uh, is a point that was added by the CCC from the 80s. While the first uh, items on this list were written down by Stephen Levy in his book Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution, um, which was published 1984. Um, but the, the, the point don't litter in other people's data and the point make public data available while protecting private data is something that got added by the CCC um, after people found that those two points have often been violated. They haven't been there yet, but uh, at least in an official statement of hacker ethics, but they found that violating these ideas is a problem and so they put it uh, into, made, it, made them into part of the hacker's ethic. Um, to protect the privacy of the individual and to strengthen the freedom of the information which concerns the public, that is pretty much the idea. Um, the hacker ethics are, like the rest of the world pretty much, in a constant discussion and development. The, the rules here are, are not rules you're, not, you're supposed to not question. They are a starting point to consider as a, guide, as a guideline and basis for discussion. And um, the web page I linked here, where I copied the items from, they even ask for comments and suggestions. And yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, one, one social situation where I found that having these kind of, or having a, a value, a, a ethics that you, that you incorporate in your actions, systems can become better systems or can, when developing systems, the results will be smarter. For example, in Germany we got ID cards which, were, which then at some point developed to be smart ID cards. And smoking is only allowed from 18 years on, of age onwards. So cigarette vending machines at some point started asking for your ID in order to evaluate your age. 
and of course it seems a reasonable uh, request you provide your ID card and since it's a smart ID card the vendor machine the, the cigarette vending machine can then figure out whether or not you are of age 18 or older and whether it should be selling you the cigarettes or not but if you have the ethics and you think oh, yeah but we should protect private data like the date of birth maybe it's data it's uh, it's data worth protecting then it probably would be a bad idea if every cigarette vending machine would know the date of birth of an ID card owner. And is that really what you need to know? The, of, the first idea might be, yeah, ask for the date of birth and calculate it and then, uh, well enough, you know whether this person is older than 18 years or not. But to, if you think about it again, then the question may be asked from the vending machine or any other machine towards the ID card, uh, is this person of age 18 or older would be sufficient for the application domain. You do not have to ask for the precise date of birth and therefore you could protect private data while, while uh, changing life for the better as the society decided that selling uh, cigarettes should only be allowed to people 18 years or older. And this is what happened. For example, the CCC consulted the German government um, and, and others as well when developing the smart ID card in order to make th things like this right. Okay, the title already mentioned it that uh, we will a little bit talk about attack vectors. Um, now that we talked about hackers and hacker ethics, uh, people attack IT systems or technical systems and they, they penetrate them. Uh, some do this for evil purposes, some do this for the for the idea of hacking, like finding bugs, finding vulnerabilities, and um, therefore it might be helpful to have a look uh, at what kind of attack vectors are there. Uh, this is a huge thing and I could uh, talk for many other talks about only these uh, kind of, uh, only about uh, attack vectors, but we'll have a glimpse view. I copied this from a talk with um, it uses uh, images from my colleague, uh, Thomas Mund. Uh, and this is uh, a slide about uh, KNX, attack KNX attack vectors. So KNX, the field bus, we mentioned before in the city, uh, but it's also more generally valid for pretty much any communication system. Wherever there is communication, people can listen in, eavesdropping into the com uh, communication, which is what you see on, on the left. So they ch my colleagues just wiretapped uh, the, the KNX bus and then uh, read what was sent on the bus by uh, plugging in wires to the, to the switch. And later on, they, they showed that it's even possible without physically connecting to the wire by just putting a coil on, on the wall and then uh, carefully uh, investigate the electromagnetic field in this area. Of course, other than listening in, people can disturb, they can produce noise, they can denial of service, the communication media, they can even do this distributed, and it's called DDoS. Of course, you can cut a wire, but you can also jam a wire by, by constantly sending bits that uh, don't make sense in the protocol. You can fuzz it by just yeah randomly putting a signal on the wire, and maybe this will cause something to happen, maybe not. Uh, eventually you may even break the system. But you can also remote control the system. For example, in KNX example, you can turn on lights, uh, heating or ventilation of somebody that is not expecting this to be happening. Um, you can do so by, by man in the middle attacking a communication where a sends B something, but you intercept it, and A sends it to you, you alter something, or you don't alter something, just uh, eavesdrop uh, the communication and then forward it to B, and vice versa. Uh, of course, if somebody send a turn on the lights telegram and you recorded it, you can replay the same telegram in order to turn on the light later on. If you don't have insights on how the protocol works, this may still be helpful to control the system. And yes, on wires, 
you can either attach to the wire or you can use coils and in wireless communication there is uh, software defined radio very popular in, in, in analyzing and, and attacking and penetrating communication systems. Um, there's other technical uh, attack vectors. One example is the privilege escalation. Uh, you can see it on the, on the picture here of the x86 uh, uh, processor architecture uh, along with the common uses. So usually if you run a computer, you run an application, you don't have the, the privilege to control everything that needs to be controlled on your computer in order for the program to run. But there's various levels of privileges. And once you reach the kernel level, you pretty much can do anything because this is what controls your computer in, at the bottom. Uh, privilege escalation works in, in finding sophisticated ways to, uh, to increase your privilege from the least privilege that you usually have as a user of a system to the most privileged uh, situations that developing the system requires, for example. Uh, this is an example of a sophisticated technical approach. There's um, all uh, all sorts of things um, that that can also be done. For example, SQL injections in, to to control the behavior of a database behind an application, buffer overflows to get into the system to cause it to break or to execute co commands on code that an attacker would like to be executed. Or, spoofing addresses, spoofing uh, identities. You can um, then claim to be somebody else. There's even side channel attacks like timing analysis. If, if a system is calculating a key and you, you control the, have uh, enough control, you can probably measure, uh, you, can, you can measure, for example, the execution time and then refer from it, ah, this execution time is not sufficient for calculating a huge long key. So it's either a short key or a different uh, crypto algorithm. So you can do sophisticated crypto analysis, which can be super hard. But uh, yeah, people are smart and some people get it done. There's all sorts of things. There's even technical search engines like Shodan that, that, that help you to find vulnerable devices, which you can then fuzz and maybe crash. Some devices may even be threatened by the scenario of energy depletion. If you think of the pacemaker inside somebody's body, you cannot easily replace the battery. So if you can cause the energy to deplete much, much faster, then these people need surgery again, which is apparently a bad thing, I think. Uh, sometimes devices have universal backdoor keys, sometimes for good intentions, pretty much always very critical if it comes to security. You can also look at the ecosystem of a system. The, piece, the pacemaker, for example, has a patient monitoring system. It has a programming component. It has uh, some, some parts that are remaining with the doctor. And all these kind of items, all these, these items are part of the ecosystem talking to the pacemaker or communicating with it directly or indirectly. And maybe some of the other devices involved are not as well protected as the one device you are currently having in front of you. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots, and lots of things. You can even buy old devices and, for example, buy a, a programmer uh, for, for the pacemaker you are investigating and then uh, check out. Sometimes you'll find data still be on it. These, idea, um, these ideas come from a talk which I refer to in uh, You Want More slide, where uh, a very uh, interesting presentation was given by a security researcher where they actually found vulnerabilities in pacemakers and which led to a, a recall of about half a million pacemakers. And this is uh, a huge thing, so he also presents his ways of vulnerability disclosure, so I recommend you watching this if you are interested by this. These Attack vectors are sometimes easy, but most often they are really hard. And there's a one, one other thing than technical uh, attack vectors, which is social attack vectors, also called social engineering. I think this XKCD comic called Security uh, helps to understand. Sometimes it's much, ask, much simpler to ask somebody or to know somebody or even to blackmail somebody 
with evil or with good purposes in your mind. Uh, knowing people can uh, can influence a lot. For example, if you're in a security building where you usually don't have access to all the rooms, um, maybe the cleaner has all keys because he or she needs to go to all rooms in order to clean the rooms. And probably the salary is not very, very high. So if it's important enough and you have enough money, then maybe you can bribe the cleaner in order to get into a room where otherwise you would spend months and months with high-paid security experts to figure around into a system. Of course, this purpose and scenario that I just described might be evil, but uh, the main point here is if somebody has an encrypted uh, laptop and you want to get into it, which is a dubious act, I think, depends on your situation, but I'm not, I'm not calling you to get into other people's laptops. I just wanted to show you that uh, doing the crypto analysis might be hard and buying a $5 wrench and just track the person in order to make him tell, it, uh, tell you the password, this is what security can also be. It's also called fenced post security if you... If you raise the level of security on your computer, you encrypt your hard drive, you deactivate all the all the uh, communication you do, don't regularly use, or maybe you don't put the computer online and stuff, and you, you defend on, on one flank pretty much, you do all that you can to hire the security, hire the security, but on the other hand, you're still a vulnerable person, so if somebody is just putting enough pressure on you, you will probably not be uh, able to defend against. Um, this is a very important aspect in IT security analysis, I think. And there's also a talk in the You Want More slide that I refer to where a physical pen tester shows you that he's playing around and getting into rooms and doors and he's pretty much never using a lock picking set. He could do that, but it's much more effort and very often there are easier ways uh, to, to search for vulnerabilities. Um, I mention this not because I want you to <laughs> hit other people with a wrench, but in case you come up with a system, you want to uh, develop a system and you hire your security, which is reasonable, maybe it's worth thinking about other aspects as well, not only the technical ones, in order to to defend the system from attacks. Um, yeah, I promise to have a short glimpse at penetration testing. There's much more about this, I think, by the experts that are doing this for a living, mm -hmm. like Alexander Gladich from T Systems. He will give a talk uh, on Wednesday. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, the penetration testing is pretty much assessing security of a computer system by looking at weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Uh, doing so by using knowledge and tools, uh, and this is very important, uh, in a lawful and legit legitimate manner. This is uh, important because only then it's ethical hacking, uh, which is also a phrase used uh, uh, instead of pen penetration testing sometimes. It's also called pen testing. But if it's, uh, it's lawful and legitimate, then it's also called ethical hacking. Um, yeah, and the purpose is, of course, to assess the security posture of a target system and then improve it. Uh, improve the, the security of the target system after you found a vulnerability, you understood why there is the vulnerability, you come up with a plan to fix it. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's very hard, might even be impossible. If there is a pacemaker that has a problem with communication inside people's buddies, then there's not much you can do other than surgery and replace the pacemaker, but the new one might as well have a problem. So it's a difficult thing, it's a difficult field. Yeah, so in case you find something with your penetration testing or you hire people that did the penetration testing for you and then they found vulnerabilities, this is, it seems like, ah, now you're done, but no, then it's, it's an entire process that only started. And this is the vulnerability disclosure. Um, I copied pretty much a slide from a talk that was given at the Chaos Communication Camp uh, 2019. It was called Tales from Hardware Security Research by Johannes Obermeier and Mark Schink. Uh, Schink, Schink, yeah, 
uh, they gave this talk at the 22nd of August in 2019 at the case communication camp and you will find on the on the references the link to this uh, talk um, they are security researchers they start and they do they do this for a scientific purpose uh, they start to scientifically evaluate the security concepts in this case those two guys are hardware security analyzers they analyze um, microcontrollers so they start by analyzing them in theory then they test them in practice and when they found vulnerabilities they create a proof of concept for the vendor and then they responsibly contact the vendor um, and say hey you have this device you have this microcontroller and the data sheet claims it has these kind these kind of properties we found that these properties won't won't hold and here's a proof of concept uh, we have uh, managed uh, to find a way around your constraints for example and eventually they would like to publish and they do publish the results in papers because at some point this is necessary to have an open discussion and to scientifically evaluate the security concept which is the target thing where they started off and from their talk as well I copied um, this slide because I found it helpful to understand there's many ways of disclosure but the disclosure process which is coordinated as they name it is uh, you start off with your research and when you discover a vulnerability you inform the vendor why because only then the vendor has the option to fix the problem the other option would be you just yell it out to the world ah you can attack the pacemakers and the vendor ha have no idea about it so they get the news from the media and from that moment on other people may attack the devices and there was no time for the vendor to fix the bug and not always is the bug there on purpose sometimes vendors really would like their devices to be more secure and more safe um, so ideally the vendor confirms then and at some point there's a conference, a scientific conference where the authors uh, have a deadline to submit and it, then they, the, the conference paper gets published uh, uh, the conference program gets published so it becomes an official thing that there will be a, a talk about a security vulnerability in for example a pacemaker and at some point the paper is published and then it's open knowledge uh, yeah, so far as the theory. Those guys found vulnerabilities in multiple microcontrollers and um, this is a process that happened with them in their experience with one vendor. Yeah, they informed the vendor. Uh, everything was a little bit delayed. They mentioned that after informing the vendor they will have a 120 days period before they actually publish a paper because they want the vendor to have time to fix the problems. But at some point the vendor just goes to them they didn't reply anymore to all the efforts to get in touch with them to communicate and then the conference deadline appeared and at some point the conference program was published where the vendor got back to them and sent them a non-disclosure agreement and wanted them to sign a non-disclosure agreement but from the point of the security researchers there's really no point in, in signing an NDA here they just wanted to fix a problem and if the vendor is not replying to, to the suggestions to fix the problem together then uh, the, they still would like to uh, know everybody about this so that there will be a higher force to fix the problems and uh, at some point they publish the paper anyway a little bit later but yeah this is one experience another experience uh, was another vendor they behaved a little bit different so they, they send them at some point they sent the vendor a proof of concept and then uh, the vendor said ah but this is not a vulnerability you should lead, read the data sheet and they did so and they said yeah i'm reading the data sheet again we still think this is a problem we still think this is a vulnerability this communication happened over and over again that's where the spiral is and at some point um, they still continued with the scientific publication process, a paper got rejected, 
So they had to uh, find another conference, another deadline, so it got even more delayed, but eventually it was also published. Um, but you can see this uh, may be exhausting, may be difficult, and there's all sorts of disclosure options uh, coming with different motivations, of course. People that found vulnerabilities may use it, may want to exploit it, may want to sell it. Maybe there is an official thing to sell it to, like a bug bounty program, which, for example, Facebook has. If you have, find a vulnerability uh, in Facebook, you can uh, check out whether it is, uh, it's, a, uh, it's according to the laws of their bug bounty program, and then you can sell it to them uh, in order to be paid for your work and still help to get the system better. There's also black market for these kind of things where you can get a lot of money, especially for zero-day uh, vulnerabilities that nobody knows about. Sometimes people just put their proof of concept on a paste bin and yell it out to the public without any uh, warning for the system creators. Um, yeah, so everything from no disclosure to full disclosure without any heads up is, is uh, what you could observe in the past. And the coordinate disclosure, as I just uh, tried to describe, aims for the cooperation of the vendor in order to best fix problems in, in the products. So question that may come up is, uh, is it a cooperative, cooperative process? Uh, is it uh, beneficial for both sides? Maybe the bug bounty pays you for your work. Is there a common, common vulnerability score uh, for that, that pretty much uh, tracks the, the common vulnerabilities and exposures so that people are interested in the security of devices can actually find the security bug which is existing and known by some experts but maybe not known by others. So this is a setup to help that it's actually general knowledge. Maybe people do the disclosure anonymously. Maybe they get an intermediary involved. And there's huge questions about the legal situation. Because as I mentioned earlier, all too often uh, the, 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 the messenger of bad news is not liked by huge companies, for example. Um, yeah, the legal issues are really something you should be aware of in case you ever come up with the situation that you would like to disclose. Uh, it's a good idea to learn from previous disclosures. There's much to learn. And this is also what's happened with the CCC, for example. They acted as spokesman for people that found vulnerabilities, for example, in the healthcare system or in the German election system where systems were broken. but. The other players are really powerful, so you don't want to be there personally against a powerful system. Okay, let's recap what we mentioned today. Uh, we first had a look at hackers versus hackers, which are better called crackers, but sometimes also, to my mind, mistakenly called hackers. I tried to explain you why the ethical guides uh, uh, the, the hacker ethics uh, is important uh, because it, it guides the activities of the, the hackers, the force for the good, as I uh, think. Um, I did not focus on the, on the, on the third part. So, sorry, I forgot it. Um, the idea behind it is if you are a very skilled t technician, for example, if you know a lot about IT security, and therefore you have more power than the other people like for example your parents or the vendors or other people have fewer skills that also means that with the skills you can take a responsibility to help improve the things others use um, yeah so and then we had a look at attack vectors which uh, are used to attack systems, which attacking means not only evil things, it can also mean a good thing to attack a system to find their vulnerabilities um, during the penetration testing, for example, uh, would, would allow you to, uh, to understand problems, to find vulnerabilities, and then uh, you can act on the disclosure of these vulnerabilities 
where I uh, presented you various styles and experiences. Um, of course, uh, I use stuff from others, which is uh, to be referenced here. And in case you want more, I put a lot of links on the slides already, but uh, the disclosure experience talk uh, from the hardware security guys, uh, it's a 45 minutes talk you can find on the media.ccc.de from the camp and there, uh, there are all sorts of translations for these kind of talks. It's a very interesting uh, talk to my mind. Uh, this is where I uh, copied the scientific coordinate disclosure process from. The, there's another disclosure experience talk about the pacemakers that I used as an example during this talk. Also very, very interesting. There was a lot of money involved in, in the situation. There is even talks about recommendations about disclosure from people that uh, deal with these kind of things professionally. Um, I mentioned the talk about the physical pen tester that tests to get into buildings and uh, 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 this is quite entertaining as well. And yeah, the last thing is a uh, German uh, uh, article about the ethical discussion of, of, of algorithms, what, is, should, what should be allowed for algorithms and yeah. Um, Generally, at media.ccc.de, you can find a lot of talks, all sorts of topics. For example, CAN bus, field bus security in general, IoT security, ethics, but many, many other things. It's worth uh, having a look if you are curious. And today, I would uh, end on the Peter Parker principle, which is something I think it's valuable. Uh, the, some people might know it from Spider-Man but the exact origin is actually unknown. With great power, for example, skills and knowledge, there must also come great responsibility. Uh, I think this is true, because only then we can help to improve each other. Hopefully, while not being free of personal bias, this talk was worth your time. And I would be rather curious to discuss with you about what do you think about hackers, what do you think about attacking uh, systems, what do you think is the right thing to disclose or not to disclose vulnerabilities. I think uh, talking about it in a group is very valuable here. And since we are in the pandemic situation to have this uh, summer school only digital, hopefully uh, the discussion now will uh, still be fruitful. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention. If there's any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with us, with me. And yeah, enjoy, turn on your mics and let's discuss.